I'm not here to, to uh, give you a message this morning, but I'm here to introduce uh, one of our very special speakers okay, that, we, that the Lord has for us this morning. And I'm privileged to announce as well that he will be part of uh, the pulpit ministry for uh, the Sundays to come. Okay? Um, I'm not sure when, when is the next one, but uh, it, he will be part uh, of the pulpit ministry as well. And um, I believe once you hear his name, you'll probably be surprised how he is related to someone who is very, very close to our hearts. Uh, one who is uh, somehow we know already because of the illustrations that um, one of our pastors has used already about him. Uh, it's, a, it's a positive, uh, it's a positive uh, illustration, don't worry. <laughs> but uh, I, as I've said, because we really have a close affinity to his family. But before I call him in, uh, I would like uh, to give you a few information about uh, our speaker. His name is David. Okay, he grew up in the Philippines, spent most of his childhood there. And right now, he is living in Malaysia for 13 years. And we are privileged to have him with us, of course, with, uh, with, with, our, with his family as well, uh, Bethany. And Lucy, who is already in Sunday school, and I believe he's all grown up from the last time that they were here uh, and, and visited us here in CCFSG. Um, he loves to, uh, he loves to uh, study the Word of God and to really share the Word of God whenever he, ha he gets a chance to do so. So uh, I won't delay it any further. Uh, let's join our hands in welcoming um, I th I, the only son of uh, Pastor Jay Jackson. So that makes you the favorite son, isn't it? Okay, the favorite son of Pastor Jay Jackson. Let's all welcome David Jackson. Good morning. And yes, Jay Jackson is my dad, but don't hold that against me, please. <laughs> I, um, I wasn't consulted about that. It wasn't my choice. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, Acts chapter 20 this morning. So um, get out your Bibles or your readers or your uh, Bible apps or whatever it is you use and find Acts 20 because you're going to want to follow along as we go. We're going to start with a little story. Where are we? There we go. I'm Beth. Uh, no blood relation to Jay Jackson, <laughs> but I've been uh, adopted into their family. Very thankful for that. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little story. I want to introduce you to someone. This lady in the middle here is Aiko. She's Japanese, and she lives in a suburb of Tokyo, which is one of the biggest and most expensive cities in the world. On the day that this photo was taken, she was visiting a temple with her two daughters. One is a teenager and one is a six-year-old. Aiko's husband was working and not able to join them for the outing. The Japanese are renowned the world over for their work ethic and discipline, as well as the long hours they spend at the office. Aiko used to work at a bank before having kids, and she's thinking about returning to the job sometime soon, maybe part-time. In her free time, she enjoys the Japanese art of flower arranging as well as cooking and has been considering learning English. The family all lives together, along with Aiko's aging mother and father-in-law. She and her daughters don't always wear traditional clothes, but they, she wants her kids to feel a connection with their cultural roots. So from time to time, they don their silk kimonos when they go to the temple or celebrate special occasions. Like most Japanese people, Aiko practices a mix of Shintoism and Buddhism. She believes that all things are inhabited by spirits. At the temple, she prayed for protection for her family and good fortune, especially for her children. Suicide is the leading cause of death for Japanese youth, and many girls are also involved in some sort of prostitution. She has no concept of original sin, but believes in the Shinto idea of purification by water. Aiko has never met a Christian and was raised to view organized religion with suspicion. Unless something changes, Aiko will live her entire life without hearing the good news that Jesus died for her. There are 124 million other Japanese people with their own faces and stories. And there are countless other people. 
all around the world who are in a similar situation, where unless somebody does something, they're going to go through their entire life without ever having an opportunity to respond to the good news simply because they haven't heard it. And it was in response to this same desperate need that the disciples of Jesus scattered all over the world, bringing the good news boldly into places that had never been before. They were, they were working under a directive from their rabbi to go and make disciples of all people and inviting those di disciples to participate in this wild new thing that we now call church, where ordinary people can encounter the living God in community with each other. And encountering God is not always easy or comfortable or safe. And some people didn't even survive the encounter, but people were healed. People were set free from their demons, from their guilt, from their shame, from their own sin. And people were loved for. <laughs> Some people were loved, they were cared for. And they joined that adventure to boldly bring the good news together with God and with other people to places it had never been before. To invite the rich and the poor, slaves and the free from every tribe, tongue, and nation to join the resistance against the broken system of this world known as the family of God. It was in the middle of one of these adventures that is now known as Paul's third missionary journey that our story for today begins. They had been in Ephesus for some time where they had been preaching openly in the streets and Paul had been teaching the elders of the Ephesian church, the, the leaders of the small churches that met in homes all around Ephesus. And they had encountered, they had experienced healings and miracles. They had watched God move in mighty ways, and they had encountered all kinds of trouble as well. Most recently, a group of idol makers had stirred up some trouble against them as their way of life and their, their faith were both threatened by what Paul and his disciples were preaching. So they stirred up the, the population of that city and nearly started a riot. The town clerk finally talked that mob down off the edge and dismissed them. And that's where our story for today begins at the beginning of the chapter of uh, Acts 20. Acts 20. <clears throat> after the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples. And after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. Sopater the Berean, son of Phyrus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus, these went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when everyone was gather gathered together, we ate and drank until our bellies were full and we were satisfied. Paul had a lot to communicate in a short amount of time since we were leaving again the next day. He talked late into the night until it was finally near to midnight. The lamps in the upper room flickered as he spoke. Eutychus, a young man, was sitting by the window. As Paul talked on and on, Eutychus felt his eyelids grow heavy. He yawned and stretched and struggled to stay awake. He was interested in what Paul was saying, but so very tired after a long day of work. The room was warm with bodies and light from the lamps. He sat up straight, but couldn't help leaning slightly against the window frame. Nodding off, Eutychus jerked his head up and opened his eyes wide. It, opened, it worked for a while until, until finally he stopped fighting and was overcome by sleep. Suddenly, we were shocked as we heard a strange noise and turned to see him slip out of the third-story window. Someone tried to grab him, but it was too late. Rushing down the stairs, we saw the poor boy slumped into a lifeless heap on the ground. Tragically, he had not survived the fall. As we were standing in stunned silence in the darkness, Paul bent over Eutychus, tenderly taking his limp body in his arms. He looked up at us and said, do not, be as, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. Confused and hopeful, we realized that Eutychus was somehow breathing. 
After the incident, Paul continued to converse with everyone until we saw the first rays of daybreak, and then we departed, leaving Eutychus very much alive, and our friends at Troas encouraged and in good spirits. If you're following along in your Bibles, you'll notice that at some point, um, Bethany moved into a more elaborate kind of storytelling to bring you into the end of the moment. And I hope that was, that was helpful to, to, to feel the tension that was in the room and the tension that was, that was going on inside that young man. Um, the, uh, okay, so it's confession time. And I hope you're ready to participate because I want to ask an, a question. And I'm hoping for some honesty. Who here has ever fallen asleep in church? Anybody? That's really good to know. I was, I was really hoping I wasn't going to be the only one standing up here with my, with my hand up because that would have been, yeah, that would have been maybe a problem. But I remember the first time that, that I prepared to get up in front of a group of people and share from God's word. It had taken me quite a lot of time and a lot of effort to look into God's word, to, to ask God what he wanted to say to this group, and I spent weeks preparing. And finally, as a young man, stood up in front of a group like this, my knees shaking, and poured out my heart and the, the, the fruit of weeks of labor. And I look out, and what do I see but this? You know, not everybody, of course, but there's, there's one over there, there's one over there, maybe one there. And I wasn't, I wasn't angry, I don't think, but I was, I was very insecure in that moment, thinking as I was studying this passage, I really fell in love with it. Like, this is really good stuff. God really has something to say here. I must be doing a really bad job communicating this because I can't even manage to keep everybody awake. And so it was, it was, it was difficult. But nowadays, honestly, if I were, I don't see anybody out there sleeping right now, but if I did, it wouldn't bother me even a little bit, honestly. And would you like to know why? You want to know what's changed? You want to know what happened that changed my attitude about that? Life happened. Because I've been there. I've, I've been in church. Like, I, I came here to hear something from God. And I know this is really good stuff. And I, I want to hear what God has to say. But yesterday was a long, hard day of work. And then I stayed up late studying for that test that's coming up, and, and that baby, who I love, decided she didn't want to sleep last night, and so none of us got to sleep. So I'm here, but all I can do right now is just stay awake. I'm not, I'm not even really getting anything out of it, if I'm going to be honest. You know, I'm just trying to keep my eyes open. And this is really good stuff, and I really want to learn it, but I'm struggling. So I get it. If you've ever been seriously jet-lagged, then you understand that too. You can be having a really meaningful conversation with people that you dearly love, and the next moment you're passed out on the concrete, and you don't even know what happened. Anybody been there? Because I have. Yes, I think we, <laughs> I think we have. That happened to us just a few days ago, when we, were, we actually flew in from Oregon in the U.S. just a few days ago to Singapore, and we're on our way home to Malaysia in a, in a couple more days. And we stopped through Amsterdam on our way here, and we had a 12-hour layover in Amsterdam. And that was pretty cool, because we'd never been to that city before. All three of us were very excited to, to visit a new place and to have that kind of time to go out and explore. But that was already about half a day into our travels, and our bodies were telling us it was the middle of the night. And we had this opportunity to go explore a new city, so we did. We took the train into the city. And we took, a, we took a look at the canals, and it was snowing when we were there. That was really cool. And we came back to the airport, and we were pretty tired, and our phones were very tired. They needed to be plugged in. We all needed to recharge just a little bit. So we found a lounge where they were, there was a piano where people would just come and play the piano. And we plugged our phones in and, and got comfortable. And Lucy went from this to that, and finally there. <laughs> <laughs> And Bethany also fell asleep. And I was left with this feeling that because the rest of my tribe maybe was already asleep, that I needed to stay up and I needed to keep watch, right? I needed to stay awake, keep an eye on the things, make sure everyone was safe. And I, I honestly, I really tried. I struggled to stay awake. And before I knew it, I was doing this number. You know, it wasn't helpful that some of the people that were playing were playing really, you know, gentle, soothing tunes and just, yeah. So I was struggling. I get it. I know what it's like to really want to stay awake, but you just can't. So finally, we, we huddled close together, and we just, we just gave up, and we took a nap, and it was, it was a really good thing. What about these guys? 
Peter, James, and John in the Garden of Gethsemane. They've been following this crazy Jesus guy around for like three years, you know, and he never stops. And finally, they take about half a day off. They eat a good meal together. They have some wine. And Jesus wants to go out into the garden to pray. And he pulls these three guys aside in particular and says, stay here and pray. But, you know, it's late. And the garden is cool and calm and peaceful. And you can bet they struggled. They really wanted to stay awake. Jesus asked them to pray, and they wanted to pray. They wanted to stay awake, but they just couldn't. And finally, the second time Jesus came back, he doesn't even say that he tried to wake them up. He just said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, and, and he let them sleep. And things got a lot more exciting after that, and they didn't get much sleep probably the rest of the night. So you're not alone. If you're out there right now and you feel like you're just struggling to stay awake, we've all been there. If you were to fall asleep right now, I've already told you it's not going to bother me at all. Probably the people that are around you aren't going to bother you at all. It wouldn't be that big of a deal, right? What about if I were, if I were to fall asleep right now? <laughs> Because I am feeling pretty tired. I already told you we're jet lagged, you know, so I'm, I, I, yeah, I think maybe I'm just going to, you know. That would be a problem, right, if I decided right in the middle of this that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just lay down and take a nap. It got me thinking. We're going to have maybe just a little bit of fun with this. How we all came to this room for essentially the same purpose, right? We all came here to hear from God together. We all came here to, to worship together and to meet God but if you were to fall asleep, you know, maybe you'd miss out on something, but it wouldn't be that big of a deal. If I were to fall asleep, that would be a really big deal. I want to see if we can come up with just a general guideline for how to know whether it's okay to fall asleep in, in the situation that you're in. Just bear with me here for a moment. Let's say you're in your own living room at home, and you're reading a book, you're watching TV, and you start to feel kind of tired, and you decide you want to take a nap. Is that okay? You take a nap in that situation? Okay, what if... You have friends over, and they're all hanging around, and you start to feel tired. But it's your home, it's your couch, and you start to feel tired, and you decide that you want to take a nap in that situation. Is that okay? I'm not sure, but I think I heard some no's and some yeses. Okay. Now, it depends, doesn't it? How good of friends are they, right? Because if these are people that you're with all the time, and they know you really well, and you're like, you know, your family, that's, you know, that's understandable. Maybe you're with people who would understand Right now, what you really need is to get some sleep. Go ahead and get some sleep. It's okay. But if someone, I don't know, say you've just won a, a major award and a president or a prime minister is visiting you in your living room and you start to feel kind of tired, would you recommend a nap in that situation? Okay, I didn't hear any yeses that time. That's good. Okay, moving on. What about in this situation right here? If you're in this photo, is this an okay place to take a nap? It kind of depends, right? Because if you're that guy right there, it's really noisy and there's a lot going on and I, it, I think it would be a really difficult place to go to sleep, but if you are really that tired that you can fall asleep right there, I don't think anybody's going to bother you. They'll probably take pictures of you posted on social media, but they're not going to bother you. That's, I would say that that's maybe not recommended, not, but that is an okay place to take a nap. What about if you're right here? If that's you... And it's, I mean, the, the ball's coming your way, and you're like, you know what? It's been a long day. I'm really tired. I think I'm going to just lay down right here and take a nap. Well, now we have a problem, don't we? Because when you have a responsibility to pay attention to what's going on around you, and you have a responsibility to participate in what's going on, then that's not an okay time to lay down and take a nap. If you're supposed to be paying attention, if you're supposed to be participating, you'd better stay awake. So let's return to Eutychus. Because so I read a lot of commentaries that said things like, don't be like Eutychus, and let's see what we can learn from Eutychus's folly, his mistakes. But if you look at the text, and please do look at the text, you'll see that there isn't any judgment there. There's no, there's no reprimand. Paul didn't say he did anything wrong. In fact, if anything, the whole thrust of the story is to help us understand what Eutychus was going through. This is a story of a man losing his valiant struggle against sleep. It's probably been a long day of work for him, but instead of going home, he decided to go to church. 
One of, the, one of the house churches in town has a visiting speaker, the Apostle Paul. This is a big deal. You don't want to miss out on what he has to say, and it's one night only. We're going to break bread together. There's going to be some fellowship. But I'm really tired from a long day of work, and Paul is going on and on, and it's all really good stuff, and I, want, I really want to get this. I want, I want to pay attention. I want to learn everything that I can, but it's getting really late, and the lamps are flickering on the walls, and let's be honest, Eutychus was probably not the only one in the room to fall asleep. He was just the only one who was unlucky enough to be sitting on a windowsill and fall to his death. And Paul doesn't say that he did anything wrong. He just goes down, he observes that God is going to bring this man back to life. They go upstairs and they eat, and he keeps talking until the sun comes up. You can't tell me that Eutychus was the only one who fell asleep in that room. He was just the only one unlucky enough to die from it. So if you're here this morning, and I mean this is sincerely, and you're, but you're, you're barely here, if this is you, you're just trying to keep your eyes open, and maybe the best thing that you can do for your own emotional, physical, and spiritual health is to go ahead and take a nap. Please do it safely. Make sure you're not sitting on the windowsill of a third-story building. There's nothing around you that if you knock it over, it might injure yourself or someone else. You have my blessing, sweet dreams, and in the meanwhile, the rest of us are going to continue our story, picking it up in verse 13. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the words he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. I want to see if we can put ourselves in Paul's shoes in that moment. Think of someone that you've poured a lot of yourself into, maybe one of your children or, or someone that you've been mentoring or someone that you've been sharing the, the gospel with uh, over time. And in this moment, the boat is leaving, and this is the last chance that you'll get to say anything to them. There's no, you don't have WhatsApp or Facebook. They're leaving, and this is the last chance you have to have a face-to-face -face impact with this person. What do you say? Paul has been together with these Ephesian elders for like three years now. They've been through so much trouble, and they've seen miracles, and they've seen growth, personal growth in themselves and growth in the body. 
the believers there at Ephesus. But as Paul's standing there on the dock, waiting for his boat to leave, his heart is heavy as he sees a vision of future divisions in the church, a time coming when rather than there being the church of Ephesus meeting in homes led by several elders in community with each other in unity, he could see many churches in Ephesus competing for followers, each preaching what they thought people might want to hear in order to attract more numbers to themselves, and even in some cases softening the more difficult part to hear more difficult to hear parts of the good news, adding to it or taking it away in order to present a more popular message and attract a larger number of people. And it broke his heart. Incidentally, and I don't mean this as an indictment, if Paul were to write a letter to the church in Singapore today, where would he address it? Does anyone have any idea how many churches there are in Singapore? This is an honest question. I tried to, I looked it up and it was difficult to find good information about that. How many churches are there in Singapore? Anyone know? Okay, we'll just work with the numbers that I have then. I, I looked up on uh, yellowpages.com and I found 503 churches listed in Singapore. And one of those was actually called the church in Singapore. So maybe if Paul sent a letter to Singapore addressed that way, that's, that, that might be where it ended up. I'm, it would end up, I'm not sure. CCF is not... I couldn't find it on that list of 503, so I'm thinking that there probably are others that are not listed, so I'm sure there are a lot more than 503. But even if you just wanted to work your way through that list of 503 churches and find one that suited you really well, try them all out and see which one you like best, it would take you about 10 years every Sunday to be in a different church to work your way through all those churches. Now, if you're going to do that, Here's a couple of recommendations. You can start with Google. You can Google the 10 most beautiful churches in Singapore. Maybe that would be a good place to start. Or you can actually go to Yelp.com where churches are being rated, and you can find the top 10 you know, like best rated churches in Singapore. These are everyone's favorites, and you can start with those. And as you go, as you visit churches, you, know, you, can, you can also rate along with everyone else how you liked the worship, how you liked the teaching, which one you liked better than that one. And, and over the ten, your 10-year journey through the churches of Singapore, then you can, you can add to the, the database there and, and uh, improve the, the ratings on Yelp. Now, don't get me wrong. Having a lot of churches is not a bad thing. It's really not. Having a lot of options of places that you can go is not a bad thing. And I, and I really hope that that many churches in Singapore means that there are a lot of people getting together right now and every Sunday morning all over the island who are seeking God and learning more about him. And that is a really good thing. But that consumer mentality that can go along with that, where we're looking for a church that suits us, we're looking for a church that we like, that can create problems. Maybe you don't like the worship style or the, the speaker was more interesting at that, that other one. And in the middle of all that, it's easy to lose track of what church is really meant to be. It's really meant to be a body with Christ as the head, with everyone participating, everyone playing their part to build up the body and to reach out to the world. It's meant to look something like this from Ephesians 4. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This was written by the same Paul, by the way, to probably mostly the same group of people, the elders of the Ephesian church. And notice what he's concerned about. Being carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In other words, it's like one week we believe one thing and the next week we believe another because the different people are teaching messages that maybe we like a little bit better. And when we like that message a little bit better, or we like the worship style a little bit better over there, then maybe we'll go over there. 
And then we'll find another church that's saying something that I like even better. And so I'm going to move over there and, and head in that direction. We're being tossed around, and, and one week you believe one thing, one week you, you believe another. And people are being sneaky. They're teaching things that aren't true for selfish reasons. This is the same thing that he's talking about in Acts 20 when he's meeting with the elders. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. The problem here is that church has become a popularity contest. And that popularity contest is leading to a distortion of the gospel as people come up with versions of the gospel that are more palatable, that are more acceptable to people, that are maybe a little bit easier to believe. So we don't want to be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. What, what do we want? What is it that we're looking for here? What's the goal? The goal is unity. Unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. What we believe, the core essentials of what we believe, it's, it's the same. We're on the same page. And how do we get there? It's right in here. What's the strategy for getting to that unity? What do we do to maintain that unity, or if it's not there, to get to it. Speaking the truth in love. Paul has this, has this idea that when real truth is spoken and people are really loved in community, that that leads to real unity. Now, this is not... We all pretend that we agree about everything all the time, and this is not... We all act nice toward each other all the time. But when God's people stand together for the truth and genuinely love one another, we become one body with Christ as our head and no selfish ambition of people or force of evil can hold us back from the good that God intends to do in the world through us or from the lost people that he intends to reach with the good news. Follow my example then, says Paul, as I follow Jesus. Not because I'm so great, but because he is. And following Jesus, by the way, is not easy or comfortable or safe. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. This is interesting. Look at this. The word constrained there and the word imprisonment is the same root word. It's like the Spirit of God has already placed Paul under arrest and is moving him from place to place. God is not letting Paul off the hook, but keeps him moving, keeps moving him ahead, giving him opportunities to make a stand for the good news, even though trouble waits for him every stop along the way. Now, sometimes God would save Paul from trouble, like in the chapter that we just looked at, where it became clear that there was a plot to kill him on the boat on the way back to Jerusalem, and so they went a different way. But this wasn't to save Paul from trouble in general. God had specific trouble in mind for Paul to bring glory to God himself and to get the good news message out. And so Paul moves ahead, ready to make a stand for the truth and for love everywhere he goes. And now it's time for the elders of the church of Ephesus to make that same stand on their own. And wolves are coming. They're coming from the outside. They're coming from the inside. People who want to divide the flock and turn church into a popularity contest, they're coming. The threat is real. And let's be honest, there may be easier ways to build a following than inviting people to follow Jesus along with me. And by the way, everywhere we go, there will be trouble, even imprisonment, problems. Everywhere we go, people will be upset that we're even in town. Why don't you come and follow me? There might be easier ways to get a following than that. So let's take a look at what the good news actually is. I'm trying to break this down to the core message, and these are in my words, so for you, these may come out in different words, but let's, let's take a look real quick. We are hopeless sinners who can't save ourselves. Can you think of a more popular way to put that? That's a hard message to swallow. The just punishment for our own sin is death and separation from God forever. Jesus that is, God himself offered himself to die in our place to take our punishment. 
And only by trusting entirely in him and his finished work when he died in our place, we're saved from the punishment we deserve and instead we'll be together with God forever. Jesus rose from the grave. God is alive and active in, in the lives of those who choose to follow him. And by the way, this is a, a footnote. Okay, this is not... I don't believe this is a part of the core message. It's just something that's, that comes up in what we're talking about today. By the way, a relationship with God, a real relationship with God is not safe. It will not always be easy or comfortable or safe. So here you are. You've got your Yelp app out. And you're at church. You don't know a lot about the Bible. You haven't been to very many churches yet. And you're just kind of feeling this out to see what kind of church you might like. And you come to a church that's preaching this message right here. And just bear with me here for a minute. Because maybe last week you were at a church that said, we're not really broken. We're not born separated from God. We're just ignorant. We don't need to be saved. We just need to be better informed. And then there was that church a couple weeks ago that said that there is no hell. And all roads lead to God and heaven eventually. And you know, I find that a lot easier to believe. I, I, I want to live in a world where that is true. And Jesus was, you know, he was a good man and a wise teacher who taught us a lot about how to live a good life. He wasn't necessarily God himself, but he's a good person to know about, a good person to learn about. And that's, that's a much softer version. You know, it, it kind of, it's, it's a little bit easier, isn't it? And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, God will eventually accept you. And you know, I kind of want to believe that because... I, I, I feel like I should be able to play a part in saving myself. So that, I think I might like that a little bit better. I'm getting, you know, four out of five stars instead of just two out of five stars for that one. And finally, there was a church I went to that told me that my life is kind of my own. As long as I'm not harming people, I can do whatever I like with my own body and belongings. After all, they are mine. And God doesn't care what you do with your life as long as you're saved. And by the way, God wants your life to be easy, prosperous, and trouble free. Now, I'm not saying that God wants you to be whatever the opposite of that would be, destitute and difficult and, and uh, problems all the time. That's not necessarily what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that God cares a lot more about your growth than he does about your comfort. So is this the good news? This message that's, that's up on your screen right now, does this look like what we believe here? But well, maybe you can see the danger that Paul could see when he looked ahead and he saw church turning into a popularity contest where, where people were following the, the leadership that was telling them what they wanted to hear. You can see how this could, co could cause serious problems in the church, splitting in all kinds of different directions and believing one thing one week, believing another thing the next week. And how do you keep people together when church is a popularity contest? Well, the wolves are coming. People will come from the outside and from among your own number, Paul says, to speak twisted things and draw disciples away to follow them. And people are vulnerable to these teachings that sound easier to swallow, especially new believers. And so with this vulnerable flock that Paul saw, and with these threats both from the inside and the outside, Paul reminds the elders what it really means to be a shepherd. His life was very hard. No flock ever grazed without a shepherd, and he was never off duty. There being little grass, the sheep were bound to wander, and since there were no protecting walls, the sheep had constantly to be watched. On either side of the narrow plateau, the ground dipped sharply down to the craggy deserts, and the sheep were always liable to stray away and get lost. The shepherd's task was not only constant, but dangerous. For in addition, he had to guard the flock against wild animals, especially against wolves. And there were always thieves and robbers ready to steal the sheep. Sir George Adam Smith, who traveled in Palestine, writes, On some high moor across which at night the hyenas howl, when you meet him, sleepless, far-sighted, weather-beaten, leaning on his staff, and looking out over his scattered sheep, every one of them on his heart. 
You understand why the shepherd of Judea sprang to the front in his people's history, why they gave his name to their king and made him the symbol of providence, why Christ took him as the type of self-sacrifice, constant vigilance, fearless courage, patient love for his flock were the necessary characteristics of the shepherd. That was a quote by Robert J. Smith, who spent some time studying shepherds in that context. You're familiar, likely, with Psalm 23, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And did you know that the rod and the staff were two very different instruments with two completely different purposes? The staff was a long stick that they would use to guide the sheep gently into the pen, away from the cliff that maybe they're wandering toward, away from that poisonous plant that they keep trying to eat. The rod, on the other hand, is a weapon. In this case, this gentleman's rod looks like it's a, it's a long rifle. This is the weapon that the shepherd would use to protect the flock from threats, both from the outside, wolves are coming, or from that poisonous plant that that sheep just won't stay away from. You know, if you really need to use the rod, then you'll use the rod. So you put those two things together, the staff and the rod in the hands of the right shepherd who really knows what they're doing, knows how to use them. You get a guy that, well, you're just really glad that he's on our side, aren't you? He's not the kind of person you want to mess around with. He's not the, 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 the picture that you often get in your head, I think, of shepherds, of someone who's harmless and only gentle. They do need to be gentle with their sheep, but when it comes to wolves, they don't mess around. They've got the rod, and they've got it for a reason. So the job and the responsibility of leaders in the church, like those of the shepherd, are not easy. Gently guiding the sheep of God's flock while they themselves continue to learn to follow God, while also fiercely defending the flock against threats, against the purity of the good news, both from the outside and from among our own number, it's a high and heavy calling. So let's review that calling in a summary of Paul's final words to the elders of the Ephesian church. Gently guide the flock toward the truth and fiercely protect them from false teaching. If you look at the first half, roughly, of what Paul says, I'm saying that this is a summary of what he's saying. It's about the truth, about gently guiding the flock toward the truth and protecting them from false teaching, which is not the truth. And secondly, he's talking about genuinely, compassionately, and generously loving one another. In other words, take care of yourself, take care of your own needs so that you can have the capacity to take care of each other, especially those who really need help, the, the weaker among you. And it is more blessed to give than to receive, and the family of God is not just something you say, it's a way of life. So the answer to this being torn apart in different directions in the book of Ephesians and here in Acts 20 is this formula right here. At the risk of oversimplifying it, speaking the truth in love is the way to unity. So what is our response? What do we do with all this? We want to take some time and we want to pray for the leaders in this group. I don't want to get hung up on that title that's mentioned so many times in here, Elder, that there is an important whole stream of uh, thought that goes along with that. But many, to most of us, would consider ourselves leaders in some context here. We have a portion of the flock of God that we are responsible for leading, many of us. If you're, if you're a parent, if you're a D-group leader, if you're part of the the council of servants here, then you are a leader of the flock of God and you are responsible to shepherd them. And this is a high and a heavy calling. It's a real responsibility. And we want to pray for all of you. First, just to get a sense, I want who here would feel like I'm speaking to you when I'm talking about leaders in that case. There's someone, a member of the flock of God, who is under your, your leadership, that you are responsible for shepherding. Okay, thank you. We want to pray for you especially. And I want to read. Wait, I've taken that out, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I want to read this passage to you, and you can just close your eyes and listen to this, and then we're going to pray for you. Okay, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now let's all together pray for the leaders that are in our group. God, we want to follow you, and, and we want to be to have leaders in our flock that are following you. So God, may we and they, may they be able to see you and where you're headed and give them the courage to lead us in that direction. Amen. So the wolves are coming, and they may be in the room already. They want to divide the flock. Get your staves and your weapons ready. What about the rest of us? This is a serious question. Are we responsible for what's being taught in our church, or is that the elder's job to deal with if somebody gets up here and says something that is not the truth? Or is it not my casalana? It's not my fault, right? If it's not my fault and it's not my job, then it's not my problem, really. Somebody gets up here and says something crazy, you can just sit there and say, well, I'm glad I'm not in a leader in this group today because that sounds like a mess to deal with. Let's take a closer look at that because did you know that the Bible actually says that we're supposed to obey our elders? Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. That would be of no advantage to you. There's no benefit at all to giving them a hard time about the way that they're trying to lead us. In other words, do your best to participate in the way that they are shepherding us. If we're studying through a particular passage, a particular book, the book of Acts, for example, go all in with that. There's a reason that that was chosen. You can read ahead. You can do the extra homework. You can, you can participate as much as you can. Is there a retreat coming up that might have something relevant to you People aren't planning these things because they have too much time on their hands, right? They're planning them because they believe it's going to be good for this flock right here. They're trying to, trying to lead the people of God in a particular direction as much as you can participate in that. But what if an elder, a visitor, anyone at all gets up here and starts teaching something that is not the good news. Or what if, like the situation that Paul was talking about, elders in a church begin leading in different directions, teaching different things about the core message of the good news? Is it your job to say something? Is it your job to do something about that? Well, let me ask another question. What if an angel from heaven appeared right now and got up in front of this group and said, okay, this just in, hell isn't real, and all roads lead to heaven eventually, so just take it easy with the whole hell thing. What are you going to do about that? An angel from heaven just appeared, and you're sitting there, maybe prob I expect probably freaking out. What are you supposed to do about that? And Paul said this about that. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Accursed. Just to be clear, that is really strong language, and it's repeated Twice. This is clearly a big deal. Is someone dis distorting the good news? Someone needs to do or say something. And whether or not that someone is you, it depends on where you see yourself in this picture right here. If this is a metaphor for church, then where are you in this picture? Now, our format can be a little bit misleading in this way, and that's why I want to point this out, because some of us 
come to church and we perform, for lack of a better word, forgive me for using that, carefully prepared speeches. And some of us come and we, we sing and we play instruments. And, it can, and hopefully everyone in the room really is here to be all in and we're participating in what's going on. But it feels a lot like some of us are on a stage and some of us are in an audience. So I wanna be clear that when we're talking about this as a metaphor for church, the people sitting in the stands, the audience, is the world. These are people that are watching us to see how we work together, to see how we love one another. Even Jesus said, this is how people will know that you're my disciples, by the way that you love one another. So the audience, if this is a metaphor for church, is the world. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus died for you, and you're in this room today, then you are not in the audience. You are in the game. You have a responsibility to pay attention and to participate. Did you know that you have a job to do when you come to church? All of us have a job to do, and that job is to test the spirits. 1 John 4, 1-3. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. So the word of God is living and active, it's sharp, it, it, God wants to meet you when you come to church, and the things that we're talking about are real, they, they, they really matter. And if you're not paying attention, you might miss something really important, but more than that, you have a responsibility to your team. You have a responsibility to study the scriptures on your own and to listen with a critical, not judgmental, but critical ear, and ask yourself about everything you're hearing, is this true? This was written, by the way, not just to elders or leaders of a church. This was written to everyone of all age groups. And it was written to address a specific heresy. But notice where he points to. He points back to the good news. Is this the gospel? If it is, then believe it. If it's not, then do something. Because you are in the game. I want to be clear. We're not talking about literally falling asleep in church. If you, like Eutychus, just can't stay awake, it's not that big of a deal. If you're always falling asleep in church, you might want to consider a lifestyle change. Do something so that when you come to church, you can have your head in the game. Because if you are a follower of Jesus and you're in church, you are not in the audience. You are in the game. So listen to Paul's plea to the Ephesian elders. Be alert. Pay attention. As you study God's word on your own, listening carefully, listen carefully to what's being said in church. And you'll find that you disagree with some things that are said. Maybe a lot. And you know what? That's okay. Because some things that we disagree on are things that just are interesting that we can talk about. And some things, they, if we disagree, it's going to be difficult for us to work together. It's like a, like a giant, um, what do you call that, a bullseye. And the things on the outside, the things that are not that big of a deal, like how you like your eggs cooked, doesn't matter. You know, we can agree to disagree, and that's fine. There's some things that if someone puts a gun to your head, and says, deny that this is true, or I'm pulling the trigger. Trigger. And you say, thank you for the opportunity. And you die with pride for the good news. Because this is something that is worth dying for. This is the hill that we die on, if it comes to that. And it sounds pretty important, doesn't it? I want to make sure that we've got this right. So don't take my word for it. Look at your Bibles. Test this against the truth. And if it is the truth, if it is the gospel, own it. Put it into your own words. Don't add to it or leave anything out. And don't put up with anyone who stands up here or anywhere else and waters it down. When the good news is at stake, get on your feet and say something. You are in the game. Be alert. Pay attention. Stay awake. Now let me pray for you. God, it has been our privilege and continues to be our privilege to join the adventure, to bring the good news everywhere. That Paul and so many others joined that same adventure. God, we want to be ready to boldly share the good news with everyone everywhere. So give us wisdom to discern the truth when we hear it. Give us the courage to live differently, to love selflessly. And give us the courage to speak boldly when it's our turn to speak. 
It's only because of what you've done we have the privilege to speak with you like this and call you dad. Thank you. Amen.